Excellencies, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the organizers, Enterprise Singapore, and the Asia Pacific Committee of German Business, a very warm welcome to Germany Singapore Business Forum Connect at Industrial Transformation Asia Pacific. Hello, everyone. I'm Valerie from Enterprise Singapore, and I am your host for today's event. We will be starting our program with three video presentations. First, I am pleased to present a welcome message from Mr. Chan Chun Singh, Minister for Trade and Industry, Singapore, as well as an introductory message from Mr. Marco Vandewitz, Parliamentary State Secretary at the Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy, Germany. COVID-19 is proving to be the crisis of our generation. Supply chain shocks and a global economic slowdown have further worsened the economic and social disruptions. Amidst rising protectionism, staying open to the world will be key to attracting investments and creating opportunities for our businesses and workers. So while the world may be in unusual times, Singapore is staying the course as a global and regional hub. We remain connected to the world open to the flows of trade, investment, talent and ideas. We will also continue to welcome businesses to base their operations in Singapore and to use Singapore as a launch pad to the region. The GSBF Connect is an important opportunity for German and Singaporean businesses to find new leads and forge new partnerships for the benefit of our businesses and workers. I'm also heartened by the German business community's continued commitment in playing an active role in Singapore's economic journey. There are nearly 2,000 German companies based in Singapore, many of whom are deeply rooted in our key industries and are well positioned to be part of Singapore's future growth story. I commend Enterprise Singapore and the Asia-Pacific Committee of German Business for their efforts to grow business relationships between our countries. Such collaborations will be key to our recovery and growth. By continuing to work together, we can encourage more bilateral trade, investment and innovation partnerships between our two countries. This will put us in good stead to seize new opportunities and emerge stronger from this pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome you to the Germany-Singapore Business Forum today. You are sending out a strong signal. While the COVID-19 pandemic may impact our mobility, it cannot impair our willingness to work even closer together and the good economic relations between Singapore and Germany. Singapore is an important partner for Germany. Our bilateral trade has developed positively over the last few years, reaching more than 13 billion euros in 2019. 2020, however, is a rather difficult year. Singapore and Germany have been coping fairly well with the crisis. Both countries, however, are battling with the consequences of the pandemic, especially border closures and the disruptions of supply and value chains. More than ever before, we need innovation and entrepreneurial spirit, open markets and a wide range of stable trade relations to emerge stronger from the crisis. We are making good progress. The German Accelerator Southeast Asia in Singapore and the EU-Singapore Free Trade Agreement, which entered into force in November 2019, are good examples of this. We should continue this approach. I wish you all interesting discussions and many inspiring ideas for our future cooperation. But most importantly, stay healthy. Ladies and gentlemen, we would now like to present a welcome video from the co-chairs of GSBF Connect, Mr. Peter Ong, Chairman of Enterprise Singapore, and Professor Akshel Stepkin, Chairman of Tusud AG. Please enjoy. Since 1994, Singapore and Germany have developed strong business partnerships through the biennial Germany-Singapore Business Forum. Our business communities have forged strong ties with one another across a variety of industries. 
In this changing business environment, our enterprises need to connect with one another more than ever to share ideas, pursue opportunities, and develop new and innovative solutions together. I'm pleased to share that Enterprise Singapore and our strategic partner, Asia Pacific Committee of German Business, will be increasing the number of touch points to bring our small and medium sized enterprises and Mitterstand together in the refreshed Germany Singapore Business Forum Connect. We live in challenging times which require new paths but also an even closer connection with our traditional partners. From a very early stage, Singapore was one of the preferred destinations for German companies in the Asia-Pacific region. The Germany-Singapore Business Forum developed into an effective bilateral platform on which new areas of cooperation were identified and German and Singaporean companies were brought together. Now is the time to move on to the next level. The aim of the new GSPF Connect is to bring even more German companies to the exceptional business location Singapore. But also, I would like to invite Singaporean companies to take advantage of the many investment opportunities in Germany. Be part of this journey. Be part of GSPF Connect. Our partnerships are important to us. And we look forward to deepening Singapore's business ties with Germany in the years to come. I would now like to invite Mr. Peter Ong, Chairman of Enterprise Singapore, to give his opening remarks. Mr. Ong, please. Good morning to our friends and partners dialing in from Germany and beyond. To those joining us in Singapore, a very good afternoon to you. We have more than 2,400 participants today, representing German and Singapore enterprises, as well as enterprises based in other parts of the world. I see this as a clear reflection of the active international interest in the German market and in what German companies have to offer. We are living in unusual times, against an already challenging geopolitical and economic backdrop COVID-19 has added on disruptions to supply chains, international travel, and indeed the way we live and work. However, COVID-19 also presents the opportunity of a generation, and I would like to elaborate on three golden opportunities we can seize. First, governments and companies around the world are intent on developing resilient operating models to mitigate against future disruptions. Second, accelerating the pace of digital transformation is another area where opportunities abound in an increasingly interconnected world. Finally, rebuilding our economies for a more sustainable future opens us to opportunities with great potential for growth. In this context, Singapore values international partners who understand this imperative for openness and connectivity. Together, we can keep our markets open, supply chains resilient, and grow our businesses. I'm glad that we have such a close and like-minded partner in Germany. I would like to take this opportunity to reaffirm the strong bilateral relations between Germany and Singapore. It is significant that the free trade agreement between the European Union and Singapore, which came into force almost a year ago, was the first FTA that the EU concluded with any Southeast Asian country. The German business community has played an active role in Singapore's economic development journey. At last count, there are almost 2,000 German companies based in Singapore. Many are deeply connected to Singapore and our key industries. In fact, our linkages can be traced back to 1840, when two German entrepreneurs from Hamburg set up, set up Ben, Mayer & Company in Singapore. I'm pleased to note that the Ben Mayer group of companies celebrates its 180th anniversary in Singapore this year. I hope that their long engagement with Singapore will inspire many other German companies to do likewise. 
It is with this same spirit that Prof Professor Axel Stefkin and I signed a Memorandum of Understanding to formalize a strategic partnership between Enterprise Singapore and the Asia-Pacific Committee of German Business, or APA, last week. As the German Business as the German Singapore Business Forum Connect, we will focus on creating more frequent and sector relevant opportunities for networking and collaboration between German Mittelstand and Singapore SMEs. The GSBF used to be held once every two years. Moving forward, the GSBF Connect will be held more regularly, several times a year. In fact, the next event will take place during the Singapore Week of Innovation and Technology in December. I wish to thank Professor Axel Stepken and his very proactive and resourceful team at OAV, a member association of APA, for their support on this exciting endeavor. I also wish to thank all our supporting partners, Tufsud, VDMA, Alliance Industry 4.0, Baden Wartenberg, Food Processing Initiative, the German Association for Small and Medium Sized Enterprises, the Singaporean German Chamber of Industry and Commerce, the German Center in Singapore, and the Enterprise Europe Network Singapore for their continued strong support as well. I'm pleased to see a growing number of joint R&D partnerships under the Germany-Singapore SME Funding Programme, which is managed by Enterprise Singapore and AIF Project GmbH on behalf of the German Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and Energy. Last week, an MOU was signed between Singapore Polytechnic, German Testing Inspection and Certification Company Tufsud, Industrial Automation Company Delta Electronics, and Singapore Smart I 4.0 Transformation Alliance, or CETA. This partnership will establish an advanced manufacturing learning journey through which Singapore SMEs can experience the entire transformation process, ranging from Smart Industry Readiness Index, or SIRI, assessments, to technology solutions and workforce upskilling advisory. This is a good example of the sustained and forward-looking industry-led partnerships in involving Germany and Singapore entities that we seek to foster. It is on top of the enterprise-level partnerships that we continue to forge through the GSBF Connect and other efforts. I wish to end by encouraging our German friends to reach out to us, Enterprise Singapore, the APA, and our supporting partners if you have any interest in being matched with a Singapore company to explore opportunities together. I wish everyone a productive session ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ong. I would now like to invite Professor Axel Stepkin, Chairman of Tufsud, to give his welcome remarks. Professor Stepkin, please. Thank you very much. Yeah, dear Mr. Ong, dear Dr. Kegel, dear panelists and participants, I would also like to welcome all of you on behalf of the Asia-Pacific Committee of German Business. First of all, I would like to thank our partner Enterprise Singapore and my friend Peter Ong for the, as always, good and professional joint preparation. When we started planning for this event last year, it was absolutely clear to me that I would open this GSBF together with uh, my counterparts in Singapore, and especially my friend Peter Ong in Singapore. Now, you can see me here in my office in Munich. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought many restrictions that all of us could not have imagined before, especially when it comes to direct human interactions. At the moment, there is still great uncertainty about how the next few months and the next year will look like. But one thing is clear, in the event of a crisis, it shows what real partnerships are worth. Instead of putting their own interests first, partners should work all the harder to overcome current challenges and open up new perspectives for the future. 
that is exactly what is happening between Germany and Singapore right now. And this is also the overall philosophy behind the new GSBF Connect. Today, we enter a new stage in our cooperation. Since the GSBF was founded in 1994, the business landscape has changed tremendously. Nowadays, globalized economic relations are, despite some current setbacks, a natural reality. We have seen breathtaking technological developments that make makes even large geographic distances easy to overcome. They also enable the establishment of completely new business models in order to realize fresh ideas from unconventional entrepreneurs. It is obvious to me that a cooperation platform like the GSBF has to respond to these changed framework conditions. We have to become faster and also more digital in order to be able to keep up with the relevant trends. In that sense, there is also something good about the fact that we were forced to try something new this year with this digital conference format. However, the general mission of the GSBF remains the same. We would like to bring German and Singaporean companies together, especially SMEs from both countries. The new GSBF Connect will continue to see itself as a supporting network that helps to turn opportunities into concrete business projects. In doing so, we will always take a look at new industrial sectors that we have not worked on before, just like we are doing today with the field of food processing in one of the two breakout sessions. One major lesson of the past few months is that trade and manufacturing relationships should be placed on an even broader footing. This is also one of the key recommendations of the new guidelines for the Indo-Pacific region of the German government adopted on September 1st. One of the target areas of this diversification endeavors is ASEAN. I'm therefore also very glad about today's panel topic. The ASEAN region is not just an interesting future market, it can also play an important role on the path to recovery from the current COVID-19 challenges. Yet, I can tell you from my own personal experience that it is not easy to open up the various markets of the regions due to the high level of heterogeneity. It is therefore advisable to use an efficient bridgehead for the related market entry activities. And who is better suited for that function than Singapore? Let me close with this and wish all of you an instructive first GSBF Connect. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Stapkin. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now proceed with our panel discussion entitled Resilience and Recovery Manufacturing in Southeast Asia in a COVID-19 World. Four distinguished guests from Germany and Singapore will be joining us for this discussion. I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Tim Philippi, who will be moderating our panel. Dr. Philippi is Executive Director and Board Member of the Singaporean German Chamber of Industry and Commerce. Dr. Philippi has spent 20 years of his career in Asia, including 16 years in Singapore with the SGC. During this time, he has helped numerous German enterprises to expand their business in the Asia Pacific via Singapore. After the panel discussion, there will be a short question and answer segment. Please submit your questions via the ITAP Connected digital platform. With this, I now hand the stage to Dr. Philippi to begin our session and introduce our panelists. Dr. Philippi, please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to everyone here in Singapore and in Southeast Asia, and a good morning to our viewers in Germany. Welcome to the Germany-Singapore Business Forum Connect, Industrial Transformation Asia-Pacific 2020 virtual panel discussion. I hope you had the opportunity 
to watch the keynote speeches which had been uploaded to the GSBF Connect before. The speeches have been very informative and they showed us the various perspectives and ideas on the current situation of manufacturing in Southeast Asia. I'm very honored today to be here with our distinguished guests and to moderate today's discussion on resilience and recovery manufacturing in Southeast Asia in the COVID-19 world. As we know, the world has vastly changed in just eight months. The manufacturing sector has also been hard hit. What was once working well at the beginning of the year may no longer hold. The Singaporean Minister for Trade and Industry, Mr. Chan Chun Singh, recently highlighted that Singapore will not return to a pre-COVID-19 world and must chart a new path by building a new economy now. Singapore and Southeast Asia will have to re-strengthen its role and find alternative solutions to remain competitive and viable for the future. International partnerships and integrating advanced technologies such as Industry 4.0 will be crucial for recovery. In the next half an hour, we would like to talk about the current situation, the challenges we are facing, and finally, what we can do to ensure that manufacturing remains competitive in Singapore and in Southeast Asia. And I'm very much pleased to have three experts on the panel today. Thank you very much to all of you to be here with us. And please allow me now to introduce the panelists to you. First, we have on the screen from Germany, Dr. Gunter Kegel, CEO of Pepper und Fuchs, a truly German Mittelstand company and SME from Germany producing electronics for factory and process automation. Gunder has been managing and leading the company since 1996 and become CEO of Pebble and Fuchs in 2004. Additionally, he is currently the vice president of the VDE the German Association for Electronic and Information Technologies, and he is member of supervisory boards That's and advisory boards board. of several German companies and also chairman of the Exhibitors Advisory Board of the Hanover Fair, as some of you might know, a partner of the ITEP here in Singapore. And last but not least, he is president of the ZVEI, the Central Association of Electronic, Electric, Electrical and Electronic Industries in Germany. Welcome, Gunther. Good to have you here with us this afternoon or this morning in Germany. Yeah, Next, I would like to introduce to you Mr. Jonathan Ng, Client Development Director and Chief Executive of McKinsey Digital Capability Center in Singapore. This is a key hub for capability building piloting and scaling new digital solutions. He extensively serves clients from the public and industrial sectors on strategy, productivity, and transformation change programs. Previously, he was the head of strategy and innovation at Subana Churong, one of the largest Asia-based urban and infrastructure consulting firms. Jonathan also served as an associate partner and director of the McKinsey Innovation Campus. He was a Singapore government scholar and had various R&D planning and policy roles. Welcome, Jonathan. Good to have you here with us this afternoon. Last but not least, I also would like to introduce Mr. Lawrence Yip from SEMCorp Development and Parks Management. Lawrence has been working in SEMCorp since 2003 and holds actually dual appointments as Chief Marketing Officer and as Senior Vice President. He is currently managing a cross-cultural team with international marketing responsibilities in driving investments in China, in Indonesia, Myanmar, and in Vietnam. He has held positions in companies across Beijing, Hong Kong, and Singapore. And he has also been awarded various accolades for his achievements and leadership in marketing in, and in business. Thank you very much to you as well for joining us this afternoon. And uh, a note to our viewers, please feel free to post your questions on the ITAP platform, as it was mentioned before. After the panel discussion, which will be about 30 minutes, we would be glad to take up your questions with the panelists. And now, 
without any further ado, let's start with the discussion. And I would like to start with the current situation. Gunther, in Germany, the onset of the pandemic has caused many businesses and companies around the world to rethink their strategies. One of the biggest challenges which decision makers have highlighted were considerations to restructure supply chains. Do you think this is the case, that restructuring supply chains was or has been the biggest issue, or are there any greater concerns? Please. When, when COVID-19 started, uh, specifically in China, and we have seen the quarantine and uh, lockdown mechanisms uh, that, of course, caused the shockwave throughout the global supply chains, uh, specifically as Wuhan was one of the automotive suppliers over there. But as shockwaves normally travel through the world, they also start to disappear from the very beginning. And that's exactly what happened four weeks later. We had rearranged our supply chains uh, or uh, our suppliers were again in a position to supply the necessary products to us. And as of today, we have a delivery reliability uh, above uh, the magic 95%. So we are in perfect shape, taking into account that we offer and provide 60,000 different uh, products to our customers. Uh, so achieving a 95% delivery reliability clearly points out that um, the uh, resilience of our global supply chain is um, much stronger than everybody expected. Uh, and our real problem is not the supply chain, the global supply chain any longer. Uh, it has been since April this year, a sudden drop in demands. Um, so the companies are suffering from a lack of business opportunities, from a lack of business, from a lack um, of sales they are generating, whereas the supply chain is in perfect order in most of the companies um, and uh, specifically our very complex and global supply chain was less vulnerable than we thought. Um, of course, we are buffering this with stock uh, in three different uh, international locations. Uh, we are turning this stock only five times a year. So we have an excessive amount of raw material and also of finished goods to cover these kind of interruptions over there. But all in all, this shockwave was not really dramatic for us. It looked like in the beginning that especially air freight uh, became a bottleneck, but even this disappeared um, and uh, we can say today, well, uh, international freight is a little bit more expensive than it was before COVID-19, but actually we can bring stuff and goods from anywhere in the world to any other place in the world. Uh, so supply and logistic chains have proven to be much more resilient. And uh, the, the argument that now we have to reconsider reshoring uh, uh, supply chains into uh, local and national economies is simply not correct because uh, even the small and medium-sized company like Pepper and Fuchs, we are turning around approximately 1 billion uh, Singapore dollars a year, uh, has proven that we can uh, actually offer very resilient supply chains and our customers are globally. It doesn't make any sense to reshore everything to Germany or wherever else because then we would have the same issue transporting and, and supplying the stuff from Germany into China, into Southeast Asia or elsewhere. So I, I do strongly believe our largest problem at the very moment is the lack of demand, the lack of business opportunities, the lack of sales we are generating and not the resilience of our supply chain. Thank you very much, Gunther. Um, Jonathan, in your keynote speech, which uh, uh, is on, on, uh, on the platform, you also mentioned um, or you also touched supply chains, but not only su supply chains, you actually mentioned three key trends um, being the rise of the intra-Asia trade in the last years and the diversification of supply chains and the shift of labor intensive to capital intensive manufacturing. And I would like to have a look at the latter one. As you have outlined, we are seeing a shift of labor intensive production towards capital intensive production in particular in China. What does this mean from your perspective for Southeast Asia? Thanks, Tim. I think in short, it, it, you know, this points to a trend or a continuing trend of uh, the shift of manufacturing activity from China over to Southeast Asia. Um, and and you know, implication is that we should see the continued rise and growth of uh, manufacturing footprint, um, as well as the associated supply chains that support the manufacturing activity. Take um, Vietnam, for example, the electronics uh, sector. We've seen you know, electronics uh, exports in Vietnam 
surged 18 fold between 2008 to 2018. That's very, very significant. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this, while it's driven by, you know, to, to some extent by foreign direct investments, you know, from the Korean uh, companies, uh, Japanese companies, but also it, it's the embedding of the supply chains uh, locally as well as regionally, right? The support, the, the manufacturing activity. And I think while, while this trend may have started, you know, decade ago, um, <clears throat> we do see that this trend is here to stay. Right? And in the recent survey by uh, supply chain auditor Kima, um, <clears throat> they interviewed um, you know, European and uh, American executives on how they were thinking about uh, shifting their, their sources of uh, supply chains. Um, and, and they have indicated that 67% you know, of Europeans and 80% of uh, American executives have said that they're going to continue shifting supply chains to the rest of Asia, particularly Southeast Asia. So I think if you take all this in, into perspective, we will see uh, manufacturing here to stay and, and here to grow. Thank you very much. And um, looking at you, Lawrence, and looking more concrete at the companies and the challenges they face in this current, in this very difficult current situation, you have a number of industrial parks in various countries. Can you share with us how your tenants and the tenants and the businesses in your industrials and township projects have been affected by the pandemic and what they did? Uh, good question. Actually, we are seeing the effect on two different levels. Level one concerns the manufacturers who are already in the development, either it is in Myanmar or it's in Vietnam or in Tunisia. Um, so the parts and components that they needed, uh, they are not coming in. And the finished products are not able to go out. Mm. And on top of all this, work stoppages and travel curbs. The second level concerns those who are thinking of coming in. Uh, decision is in the process of making. Um, they don't seem to be that badly affected because they can still do a lot of the planning, feasibility studies, uh, design management remotely. Better still if they have a remote or a satellite office in the host country to facilitate that. Um, China as well. We also see that China-based manufacturers are not that affected because China is very unique. It has a almost perfect ecosystem in manufacturing. But even having said that, Chinese orders have still taken a hit. We saw the remote control from headquarters all around the world being strengthened. But still, it doesn't help when you really cannot travel and the supply chain is crippled. There is pent up demand and that I feel is the silver lining uh, in terms of the back orders, new orders. Let me give an example. The iPhone 12 that was launched last week, um, they received two times the pre-orders compared to iPhone 11 when it was launched in the year before, during the good times. And within 24 hours after the launch, they received two million orders. So that's mm. the state of the affair. Mm. And uh, l l let us stay at the, at, the, at the company level and the sure. challenges. As Jonathan just has mentioned, the labor-intensive production is increasingly becoming expensive in China, um, where manufacturers have been increasing the use of various technologies, and some now are shifting, or even more actually, it's not only some, it's quite a number, are shifting production sites to Southeast Asia with Vietnam as the top destination in Southeast Asia. Um, what are the challenges, the concrete challenges for companies from, from your experience when they move from China to Vietnam? or other places in Southeast Asia? Well, in reality, the move from the China coastal region to the inner cities, to the far west, and then out into the lower cost country like Vietnam, for example, have been going on for more than a decade. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, um, but what, what remains uh, very real is that you cannot move the supply chain and because of the unique characteristic of a near perfect value system, value chain in China, you also cannot replicate what China has overseas. So I feel you, you cannot find China out of China. And when they move outside of China, they will have to 
rebuild a supply chain. And that may involve leveraging on two or three Asian countries to connect the dots. Challenging, but it is doable. So this goes back to my keynote speech previously when I talk about the NIC or the newly industrialized cluster. So that could be one of the possible forms that can take place after the COVID. And this would mean it's not completely moving out of China, but it's moving some parts out of China to have a second, second supply chain outside China for the manufacturing outside China and the other one in China for manufacturing in China. Yes, most mm. likely supporting the China plus mm. one mm. framework. Mm. Jonathan, if I may uh, go on, you previously mentioned the material shortages. I'm still staying with supply chains now and planning issues, which are among the challenges that companies are facing regarding the supply chains. This shows to me that risk management is of really great importance. So, but question, how should companies organize a supply chain factoring in risk management? Thanks, Tim. I think, you know, past couple of months, um, if, if we look at the pandemic situation in particular and dealing with material disruptions, uh, drastic changes in demand, worker shortages, etc., just proves that, you know, a lot of companies uh, need to focus on supply chain resilience, being able to manage uh, the, the risks. Um, and we've, we've seen a number of companies do, do a range of things. Um, you know, one, one of the things that we see companies do is improve the transparency, end-to-end -end transparency of what's happening in the supply chain. Now, this gives them the ability to then uh, you know, anticipate uh, potential disruptions and take the necessary steps to either mitigate or address um, you know, whether it's uh, material shortages, uh, demand changes, etc. You know, one example that we've seen is a, a large manufacturing company in the region that has deployed a supplier collaboration platform. Now, this digital platform allows the suppliers uh, of this company, of this manufacturer, to share you know, information in a very secure way about when components, when materials are being shipped out to this manufacturer. So in this way, this manufacturer actually has a very good handle on you know, what potentially could be disrupted um, and therefore take actions, potentially activate alternate sources of uh, supply when needed. I think the other thing that we're seeing uh, companies do is to build that uh, capacity, build that capacity to respond. Um, and, and what many companies do actually is to start adopting digital solutions. Um, wh when we talk to some of our ecosystem partners, um, Arkstone, for example, is a local startup. They've shared with us that you know, over the pandemic period, they've seen a twofold increase in the deployments of their manufacturing execution system they've seen a five-fold increase in the deployments of their digital dashboarding solutions. Right? So this points to companies actually trying out digital solutions um, and trying to use some of these solutions to enable them to plan better so that they can address some of the potential demand changes, uh, fluctuations that Gunther talked about, or material shortages or, or worker shortages. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And uh, addressing Gunther Kegel in, uh, uh, in, in Germany, so now we've heard about the changing nature of trade in Asia, about the supply chain challenges here in Asia Pacific and Southeast Asia, about the importance of risk management when it comes to supply chains. But there are also companies who would like to reduce risk, who would like to, com to reduce complexities by just homeshoring and increasing the domestication of supply chains. What would be your view on this one? Or with other words, if I may, may add, you, as Pebble and Fuchs, you have plants in US, in Germany, in Singapore, in Indonesia, and in Vietnam, for instance. So could you imagine to shift every production, all the production back to Germany or back to Europe? No, not at all. Uh, it is not our plan and it's not our vision. And I think uh, the, the future of the company would be highly endangered if we try to do so, uh, becoming backwards uh, changing uh, a local hero instead of becoming uh, or trying to become uh, a global participant in uh, these economies of today. We have to simply accept that our world has become 
more volatile, more uncertain, and more complex. And the only answer to this challenge is agility. Uh, so companies have to become more agile, have to be able to react more quickly on disruptions. And the bad thing about disruptions is you can't forecast them. There is no way to forecast the disruption. That's the uh, nature of disruption. And the only way is to react faster, more quickly. Uh, that's what we call agility. And this agile nature of uh, companies is really uh, the, the challenge of the future. The faster you can become agile, uh, the more um, protected and resilient you are against any kind of disruptions over there. And whatever digital technology can help to gain this uh, agility uh, is highly appreciated. So uh, we focus uh, when we talk about uh, Industry 4.0, not only on just the new business models, but really to become more agile, end-to-end -end transparency was just managed, uh, managed, uh, mentioned from Jonathan. Uh, this is a very important point to really understand what's happening in your supply chain and not running in a blindfolded way uh, and trying to absorb everything uh, with larger stocking uh, and stuff like this. So really uh, our idea is to become more agile, to react more quickly on these unforeseen disruptions of the future, because whatever we learn now in the COVID-19 is not helpful for the next disruption because we don't know whether this is of the same nature or totally different. Uh, the only thing that really helps is to create a, a larger agility in your company as such. Thank you very much, Gunther. This is a very good keyword, agility. Uh, agility and uh, uh, digitalization, actually. And this brings me to Industry 4.0, since uh, the ITIP also is an industrial uh, uh, event. Uh, in, it, if I may say Industry 4.0 was born, so to say, in Germany many years ago. It was a vision which was first used and a phrase which was first used at the Hannover Fair in 2011. Um, and the Hannover Fair is a partner here of the ITAP, as I've mentioned. And we are now approaching 10 years anniversary, so to say, since the term was first used. And so I think it's also timely to discuss it or to, to look at this uh, topic here today. And if I just may continue with Gunder Peppert and Fuchs, as mentioned before, is a Mittelstand company. And uh, you've been leading the company since 1996. So you've come a very long way um, and have seen the industry digitalize and transform with Industry 4.0. And now Pebble and Fuchs, amongst others, has a digital and fully automated, so, so to say, smart logistics center, a very impressive one, I have to say, a smart logistics center here in Singapore. And um, looking at the company level, what was your experience here in Singapore with the implementation of Industry 4.0 activities? Singapore's readiness for digitalization and Industry 4.0 uh, was much more mature. Uh, people were actually prepared that these things, these changes are going to happen and they had a certain level of appreciation. It was not that they uh, had a, uh, a degree of fear or something like this, but everyone was really positively looking forward to this modernizations and innovations. Uh, the setup of uh, that uh, global distribution center uh, went very smoothly. Uh, we um, employed more people with completely different skill sets. And uh, today, my observation is that uh, Industry 4.0 is not suffering because the lack of technology. Technology is there, there's plenty of technology available. It suffers because of the lack of capacity of companies to really reorganize themselves uh, to become uh, a reasonable digital player. Because if you simply transform your existing processes with all their inefficiencies and so on into a digital process, then you have a very inefficient digital process. That doesn't make any sense. So um, it requires a process re-engineering before you actually start digitalizing it and apply all the methods of lean management before you change the processes into digital. And that's the bottleneck over there to do this. And second, it's the knowledge. Um, we have not enough people that really understand the implications of uh, Industry 4.0 and technology. Uh, so Pepper and Fuchs has uh, launched a gigantic uh, learning platform with over 200 hours 
And uh, more than 4,000 people of our organization have already won went through this massive learning platform. And here, COVID-19 was another opportunity simply because people had to work from home office and they were sitting on the computer anyhow. So it was easy for them to conduct the necessary learning uh, programs and, and the effort they had to put inside was really dramatic, uh, 200 hours or something like this to finalize what we call a digital curriculum. And uh, this has been a very successful training globally on the world. So we are trying to improve the skill sets of our people and make them uh, digital ready for the necessary changing. We are in a tremendous process. Um, many of our processes have been started to be re-engineered and uh, digitally implemented, but it's still a, a significant way forward to go much and uh, if I carry on with Jonathan on this topic digitalization so digitalization to make it successfully is a challenging task and uh, here in Singapore not only in Singapore but also in Southeast Asia many companies are currently thinking about implementing industry 4.0 processes in their manufacturing to accelerate and re-strategize for automation from your experience, and we maybe also have to take into account that here in Singapore also many companies are SMEs, like in Germany. From your experience, what are some considerations companies should take note as they work towards finding viable solutions on this journey? Well, Industry 4.0 adoption requires more than just you know, technology solutioning. It requires an, uh, a reimagination of business and organization. The, re the research that we've done um, tells us that you know, successful digital transformations really requires what we call a triple transformation approach. And this involves business, technology, and organization. And let me just elaborate briefly on it, right? Now, wh what this means really is the, the business transformation needs to lead. Um, all the you know, visioning of the technologies and what digital can do for the business needs to be what we call business-backed. It needs to serve a business purpose. Um, companies that tend to you know, launch digital transformations as science projects typically would fail. They get stuck in what we call a technology trap. Now, the second element of the uh, triple transformation framework is then technology. I think what we see is that companies need to have uh, an idea of what their technology stack needs to look like to serve and deliver on those business objectives. And while they don't need to start with that full infrastructure from day one, they need to know which parts of the infrastructure are needed uh, to be built in, uh, you know, as and when they want to fulfill some of those business objectives. The second part of the technology transformation is really building out an ecosystem of partners to support the company on its uh, digital transformation. We haven't seen a single solution provider that can meet all the requirements of you know, all the businesses out there. And what we see, the, the, the successful companies are able to pick and choose the best of breed of solutions on board and integrate into that common platform, right, part of the technology stack. And, and the third element of the, of the transformation is really about the organization, how you mobilize your people, how you bring them along on the journey it involves changing of cultures. It, it's a massive change management um, exercise. Uh, Gunther talked about agile, right? That's a new way of doing things um, and ensuring that uh, the organization has the capacity in, uh, in order to execute the transformation. Thank, thank you very much. Um, ASEAN is also a very interesting place to do manufacturing because the different countries are in different development stages. And looking at you, Lawrence, uh, you are currently overseeing projects and investments across countries with very different economic environments in China and here in Southeast Asia. So the manufacturing companies all face the same challenge in these countries. The same challenge is to remain competitive. And now looking at Singapore, what would you think would be the role of Singapore as a location for advanced high-end manufacturing looking at the context ASEAN? So for years, uh, most of the manufacturers from overseas in the region have been using Singapore as a springboard. Um, there are about 38,000 foreign companies in Singapore, of which 7,000 are multinational companies, 
which is just about one fifth. And within there, 50% have used Singapore as a regional headquarter. So they use Singapore as a springboard and they oversee two or three manufacturing facilities in other Asian countries. Um, so reflecting on that number, um, there's another four fifth that are within the uh, SME category. So I guess there's a lot of uh, benchmarking and uh, referencing that the SME can learn from the MNCs uh, that have been doing this in Singapore for years for the region. And Singapore ranked number seven, smartest city by the global school, IESE, uh, business school in the, um, Barcelona. And um, German manufacturers like Infineon, Bosch, have been actively pursuing the I4.0 uh, using Singapore as a springboard uh, in the recent years as well. So therefore, Singapore is very well positioned to serve this requirement. The current disruption to the regional and the global supply chain has certainly brought Singapore into a sharper focus uh, in this position as a regional technology centre. Just yesterday, our Singapore Deputy Prime Minister Hing Sui Kiet actually mentioned about the commitment uh, to develop the uh, robotics as well as the 3D technology within Singapore to be a regional advanced manufacturing hub for the Asia. I think the key word here is commitment. That's good. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's an uh, 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 impressive statement, yes. And uh, without commitment, it does not work, even not in manufacturing with the best technologies. Thank you very much to the panelists for the, very, for the first round or the three rounds of questions we had so far. And now I would like to come, we have another um, 10 minutes. I would like to come to some of the questions which we have received live from our uh, viewers in Singapore, in Southeast Asia and in Germany. And um, I would like to start with a question perhaps to um, Gunther from Sammy Wong. Question reads, dear sirs, in your opinion, you, you may also answer if you would like to answer, but I try to uh, have one question for everybody. Yes, sir, in your opinion, what are some of the best ways you think that companies can future-proof the businesses? Another question. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that is uh, the, a very good question. Uh, that is something we are um, actually uh, thinking about uh, to re-energize um, our business, to re-load uh, our strategies over there. COVID-19, the pandemic has shown that some of our, our ideas will not work, uh, not short term, but even not mid term. For example, we started a joint venture uh, with a large um, aircraft, um, a partner over there. And the, the avionics business is dead. In Germany, we have uh, something like uh, minus 85% on travelers uh, um, in, the, in the avionics industry. And that means that they will not buy new planes, that, will, uh, that they will not even uh, maintain the planes in the right dimension simply because they don't have a necessity to do so if 80% of the fleet is grounded over there. So there's no business opportunity anymore. So it doesn't make any sense to continue with this kind of uh, joint ventures with this kind of uh, new business ideas. So we have to readdress this, we have to restructure it and have to understand what are the next steps that we can do. And my, my only, uh, uh, let's say, recommendation would be uh, not to stay too narrow in, in what you do, simply because you become extremely vulnerable in cases any kind of disruption hits that narrow space in uh, what you are. So uh, a certain, let's say, uh, uh, spread in your business activity is, uh, is absolutely helpful. We can see this in our company. We are serving the light industries in our division factory automation and really the heavy industries like oil and gas with our process automation. And that helps us to balance uh, the, the cycles and the disruption normally doesn't hit everything at the same time. Um, we can see this in Germany. We are suffering in the industrial sector. The closer you are at the car industry, the more you suffer at the very moment. But we have other sectors like the building uh, sector, which has not suffered at all. Uh, the, the, the downturn is less than a percent. So they have a stable business condition at the very moment. And therefore, automation companies should uh, or ask themselves, is it 
useful for them to step into building automation because the technology is very similar. Uh, you can use the same manufacturing assets uh, and, and so on, but it's just another uh, new business area over there. And therefore my recommendation is not to be too narrow focused because this could be highly dangerous in case your focus is disrupted. Much Gunder, and I'm uh, turning over to Jonathan, who is somehow now the supply chain specialist here this afternoon. And I have another question regarding supply chains from Megan Seto. Hi, panelists, he says, what do you think is the economic outlook for the supply chain industry, the challenges and the opportunities? Well, again, there's another million dollar question, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I think, so, so here, I think, when when we talk about supply chain industry, I, I think it refers to the more the logistics uh, That's what I in, thought, yeah. industry um, as well. So I, I think there's I think in terms of outlook, um, you know, of, of course there, there there will be challenges as well as uh, opportunities. I think um, as as we see demand recover, right, for certain uh, sectors uh, in in various geographies. Um, there will be a shift in, in the kind of uh, logistics um, uh, sector opportunities as well. And I would say that logistics companies need to be agile enough uh, in order to pick up on, on, on some of these um, signals um, and, and respond accordingly. Right? I, I think one, one, of the, one, one of the things that we, we often you know, see successful companies do, and, and this also relates to, to the earlier part of the earlier question around future-proofing the business, right? I, I would say it is really talking to your customers, right? Um, you know, the, talking to your customers, understanding their needs, understanding how, how demand has shifted over time because of whatever disruptions, because of COVID, whether it's, you know, COVID-related or not, right? But understanding your customers, knowing what has changed, um, really, um, uh, I, I would say that that would be one of the biggest differentiators between the success stories and, and um, the, the rest of the field. Thank you very much. And we have a very last question. And I think this is the right question for you because the question um, is basically, how has the pandemic um, negatively influenced uh, the, the adoption of advanced manufacturing here in the region? So I think you have a good overview from all your clients and from your tenants, how they reacted on this one. Well, I feel that it is more positive that can come up from this. Um, you know, we all know that the industry 4.0 advanced manufacturing is a mindset. Okay, it's, it's, there's no straight path because uh, it's just like a country moving from a third world economy to a first world. So it has to do it progressively and gradually. I think with this current pandemic, uh, people are waking up, realizing that you can't just depend on workers alone. Um, in the case like this, hundreds and thousands of workers, they are not able to go back to the factory. And so it crippled the whole manufacturing process. So here comes in advanced manufacturing, where the deployment, the leveraging of data, cloud, robotics, AI, uh, sensor, all this comes in synchrony. And, and the resultant effect of that is to be able to do things faster, smarter, more efficiently with less people. So I could only feel that um, the impact of this is a wake-up call that manufacturers by and large start to realize that there got to be a better way. There got to be a smarter way. Uh, it is out there. And this probably will give them a better sense of urgency to speed it up and try to make themselves more resilient should an unfortunate event like this happens again in the future. Thank you very much. So these have been some of the questions which have been handed in on the platform over the last 45 minutes. Unfortunately, we do not have the time to go into more questions. And um, yeah, what we have seen, what we have seen in the last 45 minutes, my opinion, there is a lot of potential for Southeast Asia Industry 4.0 will be at the core of digitalization to help companies retain competitiveness in Southeast Asia and to grow in Singapore and in Southeast Asia. And with that, 
the role of Singapore, and you mentioned this as a key hub for trade activities and for competences in particular, will be even more significant tomorrow than it is today. And um, what I also take home is that the fruitful cooperation between Singapore and German businesses will be essential for accelerating technology in manufacturing industries. Finding the right solutions, applications and processes that can adopt to local needs has been important and will be even more important into the future. And one should also take into account that both countries, Germany and Singapore, have a very big uh, share in GDP for manufacturing sector. In Singapore it's about 21%, in Germany it's also about 21-23%. So manufacturing is really very important for both countries. Now and also in future. And yeah, with this we now have come to the end of this uh, panel discussion and I would like to thank very much the panelists for taking the time today to share their insights about the challenges the solutions of manufacturing in Southeast Asia in the COVID-19 world. Many thanks also to the viewers for joining us today, for the questions which you have handed in, and um, for watching this panel discussion. And last but not least, I also would like to thank the team from Enterprise Singapore and the German Asia Pacific Committee of German Business, the APA, for having us and organizing this event. Thank you once again and wishing all of you a great day ahead. Thank you, Mr. P, Dr. Kigo, Mr. Ng and Mr. Yip. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of Germany-Singapore Business Forum Connect at Industrial Transformation Asia-Pacific 2020. On behalf of Enterprise Singapore and the Asia-Pacific Committee of German Business, I would like to thank all our distinguished speakers panelists, and all of you for participating in our event today. I wish you all a great afternoon or evening ahead. Goodbye, and to our German friends, of Wiedersehen. We hope to see you at our next GSBF Connect event.